Okay, hi. My name is Michael Fluitt. I am the technical support engineer for Fusion Reactor. Uh, today I'm joined by two guests, uh, Charlie Earhart, an independent server troubleshooting consultant and advocate for FR. Okay. And uh, Brad Wood, a developer for Autist Solutions and long-term user of FR. So I've worked closely with these guys for a while, um, both on customer issues and fixing issues with FR itself. Uh, and they've agreed to help me today, uh, showing you several ways to install Fusion Reactor in your dynamic environment. For this session, we are assuming that you have some basic knowledge of Docker, command box, and dynamic environments. So we're going to kind of skip over the uh, high-level uh, Docker basics and things like this. Um, so it may be that you have to do a bit of research and after the webinar, um, but you should still be able to follow along. This session is also being recorded, so we will be able to live replay uh, the session and put snippet videos out there so you can watch this at a later date. So um, we will be demoing both CFML and Java applications for this webinar. Uh, it doesn't really matter where you're running them, whether you're running them on your local box through a mini cube locally, an AWS Azure, the process is the same. This is just to show you how you would do this sort of stuff. Installing on these dynamic environments is actually based on the manual installation method. So we did do a registration form for this webinar. And based on the form, a lot of you have already used FRAM. A few of you have used manual installation and a few of you who have used command box. Um, just kind of to briefly recap for people that maybe don't know what FRAM is. FRAM is the Fusion Reactor Administration Manager. So it's installed through the automated installer and it contains the instance manager. So that's where you'll be able to scan your system, find your application servers and automatically configure them. So if you're running small environments on local machines, this can be useful. But as you start to scale to these more dynamic environments, you're going to start to have a few issues where it's hard to script the installation, and it's hard just to make everything work automatically without any manual work. So at this point, this is where we would say manual may be the better approach. I've just got up here now the docs for the manual installation. So there's basically six steps you would need to follow. So the first is that you would download the Fusion Reactor jar and debug libraries. So in case you're not familiar, the debug libraries I use for the event snapshot and the actual debugger of Fusion Reactor. So what these are, they're actually um, C native libraries, so we can interact with the low-level JVM through the JVMTI library. There is one per operating system, so there's one for Mac, one for Windows, one for Linux. Uh, you can get these files from various places. So most of you will probably have got these from the download page of Fusion Reactor. If you're on the download page, you can simply scroll to the section two, and they're under this Java agent manual installation tab. In our case, we're not actually going to use this. We're going to use latest links, basically so that we always guarantee each time you build your image or you run your server, you just get new copies of the files. So you're always up to date without doing anything. The second step is to create a directory structure for Fusion Reactor. So typically, you would do this either in opt for Linux, C for Windows, or applications for Mac. And then the directory structure will be Fusion Reactor instance and then instance name. When you have these files, you can actually then do the install. So at this point, you have your files within the Fusion Reactor directory. All we now need to do is configure the Java args. To do that, you are required to basically restart the application server. So whether that be Tomcat, Undertow, Wildfly, whatever it may be. So when you're actually configuring these args, there are various places they can be. For Tomcat, it's usually the setm file. If you've got a fat jar, they're actually in the run command, Maven ops. Depending on what you're running, it's in these different locations. We're going to cover quite a few of these today. And then we do have specific examples for anything else if you do need them. So in terms of what we're going to do today, so we have a few examples we're going to go through for you. We have an example of a fat jar deployment in Docker. 
We have a Tomcat deploy in Docker. We have a Cold Fusion deploy in Docker. And then we have a command box example. And we're each going to do a few of these and guide you through. So where we're actually going to start is with a fat jar in Docker. So to do that, I have a basic example set up, which will be in my IDE. So in my IDE, I have a simple setup where I have a Docker file and a main.jar. And that's all I'm running right now. So I extend from OpenJDK. I add my main jar to the op directory. And then in my run command, I simply do Java minus jar with the jar name. And that's all I have in my current Docker file. But what we're going to do now is we're actually going to add Fusion Reactor. So to do that, it's a fairly simple process. And we do have docs that are kind of going to guide us through this. Um, so the first thing we need to do is create a Fusion Reactor directory. So to do this, I'm going to do this above the run command. And I'm just going to type run so we can run an actual command on the machine. And I'm going to use mkd to create a directory. Minus p so we create the full path. And then as this is a Linux machine, it will be slash ops slash fusion reactor slash instance slash example. And this will actually give us our instance directory. So that's step one done. Now we need to add the files. And to do that, we're going to use the latest URLs. So if I quickly jump back to the docs, which are here, what we have under installation in our docs is getting the latest version by URL. And this is what we're going to use. So the first thing we need is the single jar. So I'm just going to copy this link. And then in my Docker file, I'm just going to use the add command, paste my link, and then I'm just going to place it in the directory we created a second ago. And now I'm going to repeat the process for the lib file. So again, use the add command. Then I'm going to get the URL from the docs. This is Linux, so we need the SO extension. Paste the URL, and then again, we're going to put our path to the instance. And that's us adding the config files. So this is effectively the same for any Docker install you're running. Um, if we were, so later when we do the Tomcat install, we're just going to copy these three algs straight out. We're not going to recreate them. We're just going to use them that we already have because they will work. So we started with these top two lines here and then the bottom line. So we've added our MKD command to create the directory and our two add commands. And this, we're now at the point where all we need to do is configure add Java rocks. So with this being a fat jar, you don't have a configuration file as such. And in our case, we're not using environment variables. We're just going to pass them straight in. So to do that, we do this. We add a space after the uh, Java command. And here we're going to add our args. So you need a Java agent. So minus Java agent colon slash opt slash fusion reactor slash instance slash example slash fusion reactor dot jar. And here we can set our instance name. So equals name equals example. And then we can do a comma address equals. And this is the port it binds to. So I'm just going to use 8088, which is the default. That's Fusion Reactor running. We just need the agent path for the debug library now. So this is just another argument. So minus agent path colon, and then your path to your directory again. Slash and the file name. You can copy this from the docs. I just done it so much I kind of know it off by heart. So it's lib fr jvmti underscore x64 dot so, and this is our agent path configured. And if you are looking to follow on the docs, if you go to the docs, there is a specific page called Fusion Reactor in Docker, which is again under installation. And here you can see this is basically what we're doing. So we've taken these commands and we're adding these arguments here. So this is documented for you. 
And what we've effectively done now is install Fusion Reactor. So it should all be working. And if it's and the test for this is to simply build the Docker. So if I go into the directory and then I can just do a Docker build command minus T here. And you'll see it's created a directory on step three, and now it's going to get the latest files for us. And if this works, we can now do docker run fat jar. And then what you'll see, you'll see the fusion reactor block near towards the top, which indicates the debug library is running. And then if we go further down, we see the fusion reactor block. So this proves that fusion reactor is running on this server, and that's all that's required. So it's really that simple. It's four commands in your Docker file. Um, it's just knowing where to put these, basically. Um, so I'm just going to move to the next install now. And this is actually a Tomcat server-based install. So Tomcat is very slightly different. I'm just going to quickly guide you through. So this is the actual Docker file. So we root from Tomcat, and then we add our app. And we don't need to touch the run command. It'll automatically run for us. So we don't need to do anything here. Um, what we're actually going to do in our case is if we go to the fat jar Docker file, we're going to copy our three MKD and add commands straight out of Docker, straight out of the Docker file. And we can just place these straight at the end of the Docker file because we've already written them. We don't need to do it twice. So that's steps one, and one two, and three done. We have our files. We have the instance directory. Um, now what we need to do is actually just add the Java args, and I'm not going to type them out again. I'm just going to, again, uh, copy them from my old Docker file. So we need the agent, Java agent and agent path. And then I'm going to go to my Tomcat Docker file. And in Tomcat, you have to use an env, uh, which is called Java ops. So with Docker, you just type env, and you can do Java underscore ops. Uh, equals, and then you would need your string. And in our case, we put the same args we had on the last server. And it's that simple for Tomcat install. It's the same process as before. All we've done is change where we put the Java args. So if I stop my Factor application, and then cd into the Tomcat, and then if I now build the Tomcat Docker file. You'll see again, it will make the directory and it will pull the files. And then when this is done, we should have our image. OK. So now if we run our Tomcat image, we'll see again we have the Fusion Reactor block. And then immediately afterwards at the top, we have our agent block. So we know it's now confirmed and running. And that is actually the essence of installing in Docker. So that's the basics of how you would install in Docker in any environment. So what I'm now going to do is I'm going to hand it over to Charlie. And he's going to talk you through doing a similar process, but on, the cold, on a cold fusion Docker image. So I'm just going to stop my share. And then, Charlie, you can take over. All right. Just a second. OK. You guys can see the screen? Uh, it's loaded in, yes. Yep, you're there. All right, cool. All right. so. What I'll show is very similar to what Mikey showed, but it is different in that whereas he showed deployment on Tomcat and Tomcat has a easy way to pass in the environment variables. There's a, a need in our case with ColdFusion to change the JVM config. So I'll explain that in a moment. But before I get into that detail, um, this is the link on the screen. And if you just Google GitHub Fusion Reactor Docker, you'll get here. And notice it's a page that discusses options for deploying Fusion Reactor on Docker. And there's examples for Tomcat, like you just showed. There's an example for Lucy. And there's an example for Cold Fusion. And I'll show that one. And then later, Brad will be showing 
deployment on command box. And what I show for uh, Cold Fusion and what Mikey showed for Tomcat will be close enough for somebody who might want to do it with Lucy. But you might also just with Lucy prefer to use command box and the command box image for Lucy. So we'll leave you know, the Lucy folks to see that example. Uh, but you can come here and see specifically if you want to just deploy Fusion Reactor in a Lucy image directly. So anyway, in the case of Cold Fusion, it's a similar set of steps to what Mikey showed. It's just slightly different in a couple of ways. So first of all, let me show the Docker file for that's provided for you. By the way, it's simple. There's one page on the README that explains how to use it, and there's the Docker file. You can literally just copy and paste it and use it yourself for those of you that are familiar with Docker. And after <laughs> most of the comments, there's really only these many lines. Let me zoom in a little bit. And so it's very similar to what you just saw from Mikey. So from, in our case, a cold fusion image. And for those who don't know, perhaps some of you watching didn't know that Adobe even offers Docker images. They do. In the show notes, I've offered links to pages about the cold fusion Docker images and information I've shared on it. So you can get started with them really quickly. But the bottom line is they're not at Docker Hub. They're in this bin tray site. So this is the registry URL. And this will just get the latest current cold fusion 2018 update eight. And then after doing a change of permissions, then it's the same thing you saw with Mikey pulling down the fusion reactor jar. And if you're using the debug features of the ultimate edition, this is the debug library. And then setting permissions, or sorry, setting environment variables. And you can give a name to your instance, pick what port you wanna expose. You can change that on the run, of course, for those familiar with Docker. And then you can put in a license key and put in whatever password you want. And if you want to set the group for, if you're using Fusion After Cloud. So again, that stuff's pretty similar to what Mikey showed, but here's where things are different. So we need to modify the JVM config file in Cold Fusion. Hopefully most people listening to this are familiar with that. And the JVM config is where the arguments at startup Cold Fusion are provided for, for Java. And the Java args for Cold Fusion would normally be modified by either you manually or by uh, the Fusion Reactor installer to add the Fusion Reactor Java agent and agent path to the end of it. But here you can see that instead to do it all programmatically, dynamically, uh, it's using sed, the Linux sed command, and to replace the end of the Java args to put the Java agent and the name that you pick and the port that you pick and the agent path and the administrator password and license. And some people don't know this. You can pass in the license on the Java args when you're starting up Cold Fusion or Lucy or whatever Java application server you want. And then those are passed into that. So again, this is a little bit different than the Tomcat because it provides a, a, an environment variable. You just add what you want and then it adds it to the Java args. Cold Fusion doesn't, but this simple said command does it. That's literally all there is to it. So let's take a look at that Docker file in my environment, ready to go, same set of stuff, really nothing to it ready to run. And I could open the terminal in uh, Visual Studio Code, but I've got it already set up here. So I'm just going to go ahead and build it. Now, a couple of things while it's building, I already have obviously the Cold Fusion image, so that didn't have to download it. Um, it it's several hundred meg if the first time you ever do it. So the first time you do it, be prepared on a slow network. It could take a couple minutes. And then notice the add command at getting, getting Fusion Reactor's jar that's always going to download it. That's just the way Docker and the add command in a Docker file works. It always pulls it down. There's talk of various ways to get around that and plans to address that. But for now, that's just the way it works. So beware when you build your Docker file, it will pull it down. You can see I'm on a pretty slow network because I'm almost done with a 39 meg download. Pretty sad. Hey, but I'm, uh, what is it? Um, socially isolated and uh, working from home. I'm set. Socially yeah. distanced. Socially distant. <laughs> uh, there was the whatever those words are. I'm, I'm all them. I'm in the middle of nowhere. So anyway, there it goes. It's done. It's built it. It's as simple as that. So now I'll just go ahead and run it. And um, I had the commands uh, set up. There you go. This will do. So I'm going to run, Docker run, point it to, in my case, port 8501 for the Cold Fusion 8500. I'm going to pick 8089 to override the 8088 that Fusion Raptor was picking. 
that accept EULA as one of the environment variables you must pass in the call field start and then gives it a name and points to that image that we just built. That's is it. I'm just going to go ahead and hit enter. And now that image has begun to be set up. And it takes about 30 seconds for those who haven't worked with the Cold Fusion Docker images. And it's true when you use the command box images initially for Cold Fusion, and then they have provisions for warmed up images, but it'll take about 30 seconds for that image to be ready. And so while we're waiting, I'm just going to hop over to my browser and refresh this. <clears throat> and within about five or 10 more seconds, I should see Fusion Reactor ready to go. And like Mikey showed you, we could do uh, logs to see what it is. But there it is, already come up while I was talking. So there's Fusion Reactor. Here's Cold Fusion, the administrator, CF 2018. We'll come up in a moment. But and this doesn't surprise me, Fusion Reactor usually does come up first before Cold Fusion itself. It's running inside of Cold Fusion. And there's the administrator ready to go. And that's really all we need to show. Um, you know, I'll go into it really quick, but it's just, it's there. And we would see that administrator request I just made would be in the request history. And the Docker image itself calls some commands internally. And you can read more about that. Again, I give you links in the show notes to finding out more about the Docker images. Here's an example of the page from Adobe. And it goes on for a few pages, a few screens of how to use it in various ways. I'll leave it at that. All right. All right. I'm just going to very quickly show you a few things you may want to do with your Docker images. So Charlie did briefly touch on these. Um, and it's about how to configure your instance. So there's a few things you may want to automatically uh, configure in Fusion Reactor before you run the images. It just makes it easier down the line. So where I am now is I'm on the docs and I'm looking at the Fusion Reactor in Docker page. So you can see in the installation example, that's kind of what we've shown. But there is more you can do. A few things you want, probably want to look at are licensing Fusion Reactor. We don't want to get to a point where you run your Dockers, but you have to manually add licenses. It's just not convenient. And same with passwords. So what we're going to look at is we have this page for the system properties, which I think, yeah, I do. OK. So this is all the publicly available system properties for Fusion Reactor. And you see these top two here. So we have a minus D FR admin password and a minus and a FR license. And you, sorry, you prefix these with minus D. So these will become minus D FR admin password, minus D FR license. So to make our lives easier, what we are going to do is we're just going to add these to one of our Docker images. So I'm going to start with FR license. And then if I go to my IDE, all I need to do is basically preface these to the end of my Java args. So I can add here minus D FR license equals. And then if I take a license set up earlier, I can simply apply this key. And that's going to automatically license Fusion Reactor for me. And then I'm just going to do the same for the uh, admin password. So this just makes it a bit more secure because you set your password before you start the server. So I'm going to copy this and then again go to my workspace, add a space, and then add the arg. So I need to preface with minus D. And then I can just make that equal to whatever you want. Obviously, the ideal way to do this would actually be to pass in a environment property. Um, in our case, we're not going to bother, so I'm just going to type it in. But you can make this as complicated as you want. You could, for example, extract the Java args to a run script in Docker. So you could have a run.sh file you add, and that could have all the environment variables for uh, license key, app name, whatever you wanted. Um, so the, but these two args here are basically going to automatically license and configure the password for Fusion Reactor for you. Now, one more thing we want, you may want to do is if you've had Fusion Reactor for a while, you've no doubt changed some settings. Um, so what, and in Fusion Reactor, all these settings go to a single file called the reactor.conf file. So this file is something that every instance has, but it's safe to copy between instances. So if you have one instance configured the way you like it, the way that works for you, 
you can just take this file and move it anywhere you need. So in my IDE, you'll see here I have one that I've placed in earlier. And this file doesn't do much. It changes my request history. It turns on some logging. And it changes some subtransaction storage. It doesn't do a lot. Yours could be a lot bigger. But you can pass these into your containers. So every instance you configure has the same settings, the same configuration. And to do that, all I need to do is use the add command in my Docker file. So if I go to my Docker file, uh, the first thing I need to do is create a directory for the config. And all I need to do is append the mkd command with conf. So I create that directory as well as the instance. And then where I have add currently, I'm just going to copy this path as well. I add another add command and then my file and the location. So by just doing this, what I've done is pass my configuration into my instance. So these things don't take long to set up, and there's things you should do. We can confirm it's running, of course, without these, but you should really look at doing these when you start uh, running in a kind of more finalized manner. And these two things, I've personally guided through a lot of people, a lot of people to do this with support, and it just makes things easier um, for everyone. OK, so these are the two things. And of course, if you want to look at the examples of these, they're both on the docs, as well as some extra steps like persisting logging outside of the containers and things like this. So you can look at these at a later date. And now what we're going to do is Brad is going to show you the command box module for Fusion Reactor and how to get that all set up. So I'm just going to stop sharing. All right, thank you, Mikey. Yeah, show us how everything's so much easier in command box. <laughs> oh, it is. Right. So uh, they did a good job of, of showing a lot of the basic uh, Fusion Reactor features. So basically, uh, forget everything you just learned, and I'll show you the easy way to do it. Um, so for anyone who's not familiar with command box, uh, command box is a, a free open source uh, command line tool for uh, ColdFusion developers, whether you're Lucy or Adobe ColdFusion, it doesn't make any difference. And one of the many things Command Box lets you do is start up servers. And the great thing about Command Box is you just tell it what you want and it gets it for you. So you tell it, I want an Adobe ColdFusion 11 update five server running on OpenJDK 11 and Command Box gives that to you. And you can type in a single line and it does exactly that for you, right? So Command Box can download Lucy server, Lucy Lite images, all the Adobe ColdFusion images back to ColdFusion 9. Um, you just tell it what you want and it goes and it gets it. And it can also install any version of Java, OpenJDK 8 through I think 13, uh, uses the Adopt OpenJDK API. Um, and so Command Box fully automates this. And what we have at Ordis is um, Docker images, which are based on Command Box. So we take everything Command Box does, the ability to point to a directory of code and say, give me a server in this directory, and it just spins to life. We've wrapped that up in Docker as well. So everything you can do in Command Box, you can also do in Docker. So I have a, a folder here that I created earlier today, and I just dumped a cold box sample application. Uh, to be clear, you do not have to be using cold box at all. Command box is, is purely a standalone application. I just wanted something pretty to show whenever the browser window uh, opened up later. So in order to use Fusion Reactor with your command box servers, and with command box, you don't have a single monolithic server that you run all your sites on. You start up little individual servers for however many projects you want to work on. Each is a separate Java process. That way they're fully isolated. They can be on different versions of Cold Fusion. Um, it doesn't matter. So to use Fusion Reactor is incredibly easy. All you need to do is a one-time installation of a system module called command box hyphen Fusion Reactor. So if you type install command box hyphen fusion reactor, that will download this fusion reactor module and it will install it into command box. Now it's important to note this module is maintained by Ordis, the company that I work with, uh, the company that makes command box. So if you have any issues with this module uh, directly, you would talk to Ordis, you would talk to me, we would fix bugs in it. Um, but this module in turn will get the Fusion Reactor jar, which of course is managed by Integral, by the Fusion Reactor folks. So that's actually all you need to do Every server I start from here on out for all of eternity will always run the latest version of Fusion Reactor. I don't need to touch any JVM args. I don't need to edit any properties files. I don't need to set environment variables. I have done everything I need to do to have the latest version of Fusion Reactor. Like in my, by, when I say latest, I mean if they release Fusion Reactor 833 tomorrow 
and you restart your server, you've got it. You had to do nothing. You don't lift a finger. We automatically detect new versions when we download them. So um, starting up my server, actually before I start the server, uh, you'll wanna go ahead and put in a license key. So when you install the, uh, the Fusion Reactor module in the command box, that registers some additional commands for you, one of which is FR register. So um, you'll take your license key that you get when you either download the trial or when you purchase your license and you can pass that into the FR register command and that will store that license key and any servers you start will just automatically use that license key. So all I have to do now is just start my server. Uh, out of the box, we're gonna get a Lucy 5.3 server just because I haven't asked for anything else um, in particular. Um, and so once the server starts, there's a couple things if you're not familiar with command box. Unfortunately, I can't really zoom in to make it look bigger but you'll see a little icon just appeared in my system tray and it's a Lucy logo because I started a Lucy server. And in my other monitor, my browser window popped open. So here's my little sample cold box app that I just started up on Lucy. We don't really care about him, so I'll get rid of him. Uh, if I click on the icon, we have some options down here. I, I apologize, they're, they're very small. I can stop the server. I can open up the uh, Lucy administrator, the, the, the web route, different things. There's also an icon that gets added to this menu called Open Fusion Reactor. So the Fusion Reactor module contributes this icon here and we can just jump into uh, ooh, there we go with my browser window, that'll pop open Fusion Reactor. Um, you see that Fusion Reactor is opened on a random port. You can control that port out of the box. The default behavior is command box will always choose random ports so you never have conflicts. So if I start five servers in command box, I have five separate instances of Fusion Reactor running and they're all on five separate ports. There was no overlap. They don't conflict with each other or cause any problems. Um, and here you see it's just a, a regular Fusion Reactor installation. There's also a nice little shortcut from the command line. You can use the fr open command, which also comes with the module. That will also pop open the uh, Fusion Reactor web UI into a browser window for you as well. So um, I feel like there's not much to demo since it's like one command and now you have Fusion Reactor installed. Uh, so we covered a whole bunch of configuration things. Um, I talked about the license key but there's a lot more. Basically everything that we've covered, you can also manage. But again, you don't need to touch JVM args. What we have in uh, command box is a little thing called the server.json file. And the server.json wraps up everything that you would typically put in your jvm.config or your server.xml or your web.xml or your Apache configuration. Command box is a fully featured self-contained development web server and servlet container all in one. So HTTP ports, SSL certs, AJP configuration, uh, access logging, URL rewriting, all of that is all contained in this one server.json file. And this allows you and all of your coworkers, when they type server start in command box, they get the exact same server. Even if they're on Windows, Mac, Linux, doesn't matter. All of your coworkers can run the exact same server and one JSON file controls everything. So what we can do is we can add settings into our server.json that will get picked up by convention. Um, so if I uh, add a Fusion Reactor key, Fusion Reactor, uh, I can set the password uh, directly uh, in the JSON file. So do my pass, remind me what that is later on when I'm trying to log in and I've forgotten what I've typed. Um, we can do my pass. Uh, there's actually a whole um, list of settings. If you go to the command box docs and you go under, oop, not package management, embedded server, there's a whole section in here based uh, on the Fusion Reactor module. And this covers all the settings you can set. So custom ports, you can disable the module. You can have a different license key for every server you start if you like. Um, you can dial in custom versions of Fusion Reactor. Uh, the debugger libraries that were mentioned earlier, those are actually installed automatically. You don't even need to do any work. Those are just included out of the box for you. Um, and then keep scrolling, here we go. So here's a whole list of all the first class settings that we support in your server.json. So you don't need to worry about what the name of the annoying JVM args are behind the scenes. We take care of that for you. So when you set fusionreactor.password, we automatically do that minus D FR admin password for you when your server starts up. So all the, the cloud settings, um, lease settings, application naming, obfuscating parameters, all those settings that are supported by Fusion Reactor, there's, there's first class settings in your server.json. So if we take a look in, oops, I'm typing in the wrong window. If we take a look at what my server.json looks like, uh, we see there's some rewrites enabled that we don't really care about. And now we have our password set. 
So if I were to restart the server, it would stop it and start it with the latest JVM arguments. And that would include a password that I had set. Da -da -da. All right, the server's restarted. See if Fusion Reactor is ready. Fusion Reactor usually, usually starts up pretty quickly as, uh, as Charlie was mentioning. Of course, it, uh, it remembered the fact that I'm logged in. All right, so it should be my pass if I type it correctly. Hey, wow, yay, I set the password. Okay, so a uh, quick example of that. Um, what else was I going to show? There was an example I was going to demonstrate. The uh, Just quickly, password. Brad, um, one thing yes. you may want to, one thing I've seen that can trip people up with FR is the instance name. Oh, because that's a good point. Yeah, because it's um, in the server JSON. So yeah, so the instance name is what will show up in the, the cloud if you have multiple instances. And you see it right here in the top right-hand corner of my screen. Whoa, I zoomed in a bit too far. So FR demo is, is the instance name. By default, that pulls from the name of the command box server. Um, so if we uh, look at the information about the server we're currently running, uh, we can see that, uh, where does it show up on the screen? Here we go. Uh, we can see the name of the command box server is FR demo. And that was just pulled by default from the folder that my server is running inside of. You can control the name of your server by doing server set name, uh, my other <laughs> FR demo, right? We can come up with, a, with a, a name of our choice and that gets put into the server.json file. And then when we restart the server, Fusion Reactor will automatically inherit that server name. So if you want to control the way that Fusion Reactor presents itself, you can just change the name of your server. Or you can tap into some of these settings that I showed here in the docs. Oh, did I close that? I always close windows uh, right after I decide I still want them. Uh, you can also turn off the auto application naming setting, and then you can set an explicit name if for some reason you want the the Fusion Reactor instance name to be different than your server name. Okay, so um, before I show a quick environment variable, um, oh yes, uh, reactor.conf. We mentioned the, uh, Mikey showed an example of pulling up the um, configuration file. You can do the same thing with uh, the Fusion Reactor module. We have a first class setting for that. If I go into my menu and I open up the server home, this is the folder on my hard drive where the server lives. Um, I didn't mention this earlier. Command Box uses Undertow, which is a JBoss product. It's what powers under uh, JBoss Wildfly, which is a server container like Tomcat. Um, Undertow is what Command Box uses to spin up war files, basically. So you can run Lucy or Adobe Cold Fusion. You can actually run any valid Java war file on Command Box, even if it's not a, a Cold Fusion specific server. Um, so when we start our server, we sort of create on the fly the war that we're starting and fusion reactor lives in here where our war is. So if we take, uh, were to copy our comp, our reactor.com file, you can see I haven't set any settings in this one, but we could copy this out into the web route with this, maybe a snapshot of the settings we wanted to include by default. And then we would set on our server, server set fusion reactor dot. And I believe it is um, reactor comp file. I believe so. We can double check the, the docs on that. And you just simply point to wherever that, that reactor.com file lives. So that would allow you to easily point to um, a custom file. So if you completely forget the server, you know, wipe it off your hard drive and start it fresh, you always come back with those same settings. So um, <clears throat> the good news is about Docker. I'm not going to do a Docker demonstration. Um, everything I showed here in command box just ports directly over to Docker when you're using the Ordis command box Docker images. Um, so you would take your regular Docker file as you use it right now, and you would simply add in box install command box hyphen fusion reactor uh, as part of your build process. And then inside of your server.json, you would put your license key, your password, your custom ports, whatever configuration items you wanted. And when that Docker image boots up, it would work the exact same way command box does. It would grab the fusion reactor jar, it would load in the settings and you, had a, you would have access to it. So you don't need to um, really do anything outside of what I've shown. I would, do, I would like to show you, however, that uh, command box does also support basic environment variables in the, uh, in the JSON files. So if we wanted the password, uh, I shouldn't have used um, notepad because uh, Notepad doesn't allow me to zoom in. Let's fire up code. 
in case you didn't see what I did there, I typed exclamation mark code, which runs the native VS code binary, and I asked it to open my server.json. It's a nice little trick you can do from any command line. Um, so if I didn't want to hard code the password into my server.json file, which a lot of people don't like to put passwords into the repo, and typically you commit your server.json file, then what you can do is you can replace these with um, environment variable placeholders. So this is the syntax that command box uses. It's similar to a lot of Java libraries. It's a dollar sign and then two curly braces enclosing the name of the environment variable you would like. So we store that in the server.json file. And then um, in this case, I'm not inside of Docker, but I could just set in my command box shell um, an environment variable called fr pass, and I could set it equal to uh, Charlie, right? And so if I restart my server now, um, oops. Let me try that again. Oh, I've made it angry. My server's angry. Okay, we'll ignore that for now. I think I may have uh, accidentally messed this up. That's okay. I don't need to show it. Uh, based on that, uh, on that environment variable placeholder, I can then uh, define an environment variable, whether it's in the command box shell or whether it's through, you know, a Docker secret or a Docker compose file, I can create an environment variable of that name. And then when the server starts up, it'll grab an environment variable. So that's the same as the, uh, for the password, for the license key, any of the settings that you can apply to um, Fusion Reactor, you can put placeholders in your server.json files. That way you can control these things at runtime, um, even potentially without rebuilding the container if you wanted to change the environment variables on the container. So um, I, that there's a lot more features in there, but that covers, I think, the basics. And I think it covers everything that Mikey and Charlie had shown. Um, but it's, it's, uh, it's much more portable, and you don't need to do any manual downloading. The Fusion Reactor team automatically, uh, whenever they publish new versions of Fusion Reactor, they place those up on the ForgeBox website. And that's what allows Command Box, every time you start a server, to say, hey, ForgeBox, what's the, the current version of Fusion Reactor? And ForgeBox says, why, it's 8.3.2. And then command box says, oh, I don't have that one. It downloads it. It actually caches it locally. So uh, Fusion Reactor's jar does not get downloaded every time you start command box. It uses a local artifact cache. So if it's downloaded at once, it knows that it doesn't need to download it a second time or a third time. Um, and you always stay up to date with the Fusion Reactor versions when you're using the, uh, the command box module. So um, if you have any questions, I think we'll have the uh, link to command box in the show notes. Um, mm -hmm. If you have questions about command box, you can ask Ordis people like myself about that because command box is managed by Ordis as a separate product. Um, and if you're not sure who the question is goes to, if you just jump in like the performance monitoring channel on Slack, Mikey and I are both in there and we'll figure out uh, who, who's who's best equipped to answer your question. So I think it's back to you, Mikey, unless there's any other yeah. things you guys want to make point um, out. I find, because I'm initially from a Java background, not a Cold Fusion background. So for me, the kind of underlying engine of command box is really quite it's definitely different to other servers, but it really does show you can make it portable if you kind of have the proper layers on top. Because mm -hmm. it's just something you don't see with kind of your traditional uh, cold fusions, your Lucy's, that sort of thing. Yeah. Um, so it is, yeah, it's a very different approach. But I think as I've seen a lot more people, well, we as Fusion Retro, I've seen a lot more people moving to Command Box briefly. And it, it is very quick to set up. So like you said, within two or three commands, everything's up and running and you don't need to worry about it. It just will. So I think in terms of content, there wasn't much more we were going or we needed to show. Um, so there are a few things you may, if you're running in these dynamic environments, want to look at. Um, so one of these things is the ephemeral data service. So in Fusion Reactor, we have this thing called the enterprise dashboard. Um, so what this is, is a centralized dashboard for all your instances so that you can see kind of the overall state of all these linked instances at once. It works kind of like the instance manager. For smaller environments, it works great, but it has some caveats because dynamic registering to the dashboard wasn't great. So what you could actually look at is the ephemeral data service. So if I scroll to the top here and then just zoom in a bit, and it's obviously blurred because it's zoomed in, not that great screenshot. But what you can see is this top bar here you have is groups. 
So you have here five groups, and then in the groups, it's scalable for thousands of instances. So what you would have effectively is all your instances are available on one dashboard. And if you use it specifically use the ephemeral data service, what's really cool is it creates a tunnel between the dashboard and the instance. So usually with FR, you'd expose a port for Fusion Reactor. You can completely disable that port. And if you use the ephemeral data service, you can effectively tunnel into instances securely without having any firewall holes or anything like that in your environment. Uh, that is coming to cloud at some point, obviously with um, COVID and other things, we've had to push that development back a bit, but it is coming in the future. And the idea is basically you can tunnel into instances from anywhere. So you have one exposed port in the cloud and your Docker network, wherever it is, and you can tunnel to every single instance from there. So that is one thing you may want to look at. And the other thing is the cloud itself. So the cloud itself, this is my local cloud that I use for development, so I don't really have anything on it right now. But what you have with the cloud is basically, rather than with a fusion reactor where all your data is local, your data will push to a centralized cloud. So however many instances you have online, they all push to a central location. You can access the data from all of them. It's stored for up to 90 days, depending on your plan, so you can go back a long time in the history. It aggregates for things like application level, and it has lots of alerting. So it's very configurable in that sense. And uh, Brad, you use cloud yourself. You know, you're a, you are a cloud customer. It's... Yes, we do use it. And we use it with command box. So um, at the moment, uh, even if you are an existing customer of FR, you can go to app.fusionreactor.io, or I think from the Fusion Reactor website, there's a direct link, and you can get a free two-week trial of the cloud even if you're an existing customer, you just get a trial and you try it for two weeks completely free. And then you can drop back to your others, your previous subscription, or you can move to the cloud, whichever you prefer. But it really gives you this tool where if you're running in dynamic environments where you've got load balancing, auto scaling, these sort of things, you can access the data wherever you are. So that's kind of one of the really key benefits of the cloud. And we touched on it briefly in the last webinar, and I believe we recently put a video out as well. Um, yeah, in the just, channel. just to add to that, like we use Docker inside of Docker Swarm and um, you can't directly target a port on a specific instance inside of Docker Swarm. So just given the, the limitations of things like Docker Swarm, it's not possible for me to hit the, the local Fusion Reactor instances. So that's where cloud comes into play. And I can use the Fusion Reactor cloud to still monitor all of my instances, even if they're spinning up or spinning down throughout the day. Um, it gives me kind of a consolidated uh, view of that, which is really nice. Um, if you do have any suggestions for topics or anything you wanted to look at, you can, for anything with the, related to the webinars, you can contact me directly at uh, mikey at fusion-reactor.com. Okay, then in this case, we will end it here. Uh, thank you for watching, and hopefully we will see you on the next one.